So as we continue to explore eukaryotic cellular anatomy, um, we want to remind ourselves that, remember, eukaryotes are big, very complicated. They have many rooms inside the cell. And those many rooms allow different reactions to occur under optimized conditions. That's the point of having organelles, that we can do biochemistry in a setup that optimizes it. Now, we talked about the endomembrane system and the pathways that a protein can take through the endomembrane system to arrive at its final destination if, in fact, it's a glycosylated protein, a protein that has sugar added to it. Now, there are other destinations in the cell that aren't necessarily served by um, the endomembrane system or aren't a target of the endomembrane system, and those are the semi-autonomous organelles for starters. So semi-autonomous organelles are the mitochondria and the chloroplasts. So mitochondria are in all eukaryotic cells, while chloroplasts are only in green plants. So the mitochondria are kind of the power plants of the cell. They're going to produce energy in the form of ATP, and that is going to be the biological fuel for the cell. We're going to talk a little bit more about ATP later, but for now just know it's a chemical that the cell can utilize readily for biological energy. Where do we get ATP? We make it in the mitochondria. How do we make it? We break down the food that you eat to produce ATP. And that's a relatively complex process. We'll talk a little bit about that more later. Um, but if you want more detail on that, take a biochemistry course or, for example, molecular and cellular biology, um, which will go into the biochemical reactions in more detail. So we have mitochondria. We have chloroplasts. Chloroplasts are now only found in green plants. Um, they are the site of photosynthesis. And photosynthesis is the major biochemical reaction that converts sunlight energy ultimately into sugars, into biological energy. So we want to think of the chloroplast as the solar-powered sugar factories of a plant cell. So they're going to make the sugar that ultimately um, is the food that you will break down. Because if you eat animals, those animals had to eat other animals or plants. Where do the plants get their food? They make their own food here in the chloroplast. Where do they get the energy to make that food? From the sun. And we'll come back to that idea again later as well. Now, I, I call these two, chlor or these two organelles semi-autonomous. So what does that mean? Well, that if you have autonomy, right? If your boss, let's say you have a job and your boss gives you autonomy, it means you get to do what you want. So these organelles are semi-autonomous because they kind of get to do what they, own, what they want, but not all the time. And so what this says is that, or what it lends itself to, is what's called the endosymbiotic theory. So the evidence is very, very strong for the idea that both chloroplasts and mitochondria were at one time living bacteria. And so what we see is that in mitochondria and chloroplasts, they have their own, a little bit, of their own DNA. They have their own ribosomes. And that DNA and those ribosomes look like they're prokaryotic in origin that other major class of cells. Right? So what probably happened two billion years ago or so, there was a bacterium that did oxidative respiration, cellular respiration. This is what happens in the mitochondria. And um, either it was engulfed because a, food, a bigger cell wanted to eat it, or it was like um, an infection. It was trying to invade that cell, but something went wrong. And instead of being engulfed and used for food, it entered into this symbiotic relationship. Symbiosis means that we're living together in contact, um, and there's a relationship there. Endo, inside, so indi endo, inside, symbiosis, living together. Ultimately, over those billions of years, um, we lost more and more of the prokaryotic genome from that uh, cell that came inside, and ultimately we see what we have today is these organelles that are semi-autonomous because they have the remnants of their original independent life, um, but are no longer so. So again, chloroplasts and mitochondria are semi-autonomous organelles. Um, I also want to talk about the cytoskeleton as another component of cellular anatomy. So the cytoskeleton is not a membrane-bound organelle, but rather it's a meshwork of proteins that is inside the cell. It gives the shell, cell support and shape, just like your skeleton does. Your skeleton's made of rigid bones. The cytoskeleton can be rigid, um, but it's also very malleable. It can break down components and rebuild them. It's going to be responsible for moving things around the cell as well. So you can see here we have micro, uh, microscope pictures that highlight the cytoskeleton. 
very, very extensive throughout the cell. It's very, very important. Okay, and here in multiple cells throughout a plant system. These are plant cells adjacent to each other. So speaking of plant cells, I want to bring up another component of cell anatomy that we only find in um, eukaryotic plant cells, and that is a cell wall. And so this is now a structure to the exterior of the um, plasma membrane. So you can literally dissolve the cell wall of a plant and have a plant cell survive, um, and can it regenerate a new cell wall, but it generally is going to be much, much happier if it has that cell wall. It's built to have that. And that cell wall is made of cellulose. We talked about this before when we talked about carbohydrates. That cellulose is basically glucose linked in a way that we can't dissolve. But it is, it is um, secreted outside the cell and wrapped, those fibrils are wrapped around the cell to give it great structural support. Now, if you have cell walls between plant cells, in this case we have a special structure called a plasma desmida that's going to be able to breach those two cell walls. So you can see here on the right, you see the two different cells and the extensive cell wall between them. And then you can see the cartoon here that shows you, in many cases, you'll have this little bridge of cytoplasm connecting the two cells. This is, in fact, a very complex structure, but it's going to regulate the movement of substances between those two cells. And as you go forward and maybe study plant physiology, you'll talk about what's called the symplast, which is the connected cytoplasm of the plant body. So between all these cells, all the cytoplasm is connected ultimately by plasma desmina. Now animals have a very, very rough analogous structure. So rough in the sense that they're very, very different structure-wise, but they do connect adjacent cells, and they're called gap junctions. So these are little pores between cells, not all animal cells, only between certain tissues, um, but just be aware of them, that then very, very small molecules can move freely between the cytoplasm. Now finally, the last structure that we want to talk about, the last two types of structures in the eukaryotic cell, are um, flagella and cilia. So these are extensions of the cell, and in flagella, they're a long whip-like structure. And a sperm cell is kind of the classic example. It's mostly flagella. And that flagella moves in a wave-like motion to propel the cell through the liquid media. Now, there's another structure that acts as um, a locomotion kind of purpose, and that is what are called cilia. So the bottom picture here, now you see this kind of looks like a hairy cell. Those hairs are actually cilia, and they will all wave and beat in coordination to move the cell forward. So cilia short, they're like a bunch of little oars on the side of a boat pushing along by that flagella's long, long whip-like structure to move the cell um, through a liquid media.